excited to have a few minutes to talk to you about what we think is a really fun, new, cool concept that really is touching on how to bring more flexibility into your whole ecosystem. So before we get started, our blurb, we, were, we got promoted to actually speak in the bigger room, um, but our, our discussion actually got shrunken a little bit, so we're not gonna cover the data and AI piece for those of you who read ahead in your program. So we'd love to talk about that over drinks if anyone wants to do that, because what else do you want to talk about data and AI over without a drink in your hands? So, this is what, anyway. is what is referred to as an audible. Yes. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So at any rate, we're very excited to be here. And um, we want to talk about a new concept around driving more flexibility. So let's get right into it. Albert, walk us through how the employee is now in the lead as we've been talking about the fact that they are. Yeah, I think you know we've all heard about the great resignation. I think everybody realized or even heard uh, the commentary that I think 3% of the workforce had left in September. Um, and really, again, I, I don't think I'm, I'm re repeating anything anybody doesn't already know. But if you take a look at these stats, when you're thinking about 50% of uh, employees say they intend to find a new job in 2021. This is up from 35% from the previous year. Um, one, uh, one metric here that actually ca really caught my attention was that each resignation cost a company up to one third of the worker's annual salary. That means if you've got somebody that's being paid $100,000 and they leave the company, it's costing your organization $30,000. I don't know if, Emily, you want to? Yeah, I think, you know, we've all heard about this. We've heard it's continuing. It's a responsibility that we have to think about how do we start to really elevate the thought around the employee as the consumer of the space. Right. So with that, with that said, I don't think we need to read through the rest of these. We can kind of keep going forward. And so what Emily and I thought is with so much at stake and at so much human capital um, really being considered by organizations on how do we attract and perhaps retain the best talent, uh, we started to explore the design solutions a lot of organizations have and come up with. And I tell you what, they are really astounding. So for example, Neighborhoods with higher cubicle walls, which is something I actually heard at a, uh, at a presentation. A response to COVID would be a neighborhood model with higher cubicle walls. And I just think as a design community, we can do a little bit better than that. <laughs> um, the next one I think actually just shines with creativity and innovation, and they really put a lot of thought into this is they drew around circles around workstations so that you, could, you should not enter into their zone. Well, you know, it's, it's trust. tape on the floor. At least it looks produced, right? It's tape, yeah. And so, and actually, I really appreciated Peter's, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Peter, but Brett's uh, presentation, because it was some of the better kind of designs that I've seen. It's a better response to some of our COVID challenges. Um, the, other, the other thing that we started to see is that suddenly, since COVID has happened, we're now starting to say, oh, we need to be more human-centric design or we need to do ex experience design. And it made me wonder, is like, who have we been designing for then, <laughs> right? Having said that, Emily and I did a project in, in, uh, in Seattle in which we actually uh, designed a building for Rover, um, who's a dog walking kind of app. And so we had to design workstations and common areas to accommodate dogs. So in that case, it really was for the dogs. Um, but there is something to this. I think there's something, especially after sort of the movement of modernism, that we simply do not always consider the human experience. And now that we're entering a post-COVID work, ex work experience, we're defining not just what the workplace is, but how does the workplace support the overall experience? And I put the slide up here, and I challenge any of you to do this. Go to Google, put in a modern architecture or interior architecture or interior tenant tenant improvements, and see how many people you actually see in these pictures. All right, so, so how do we get there? So we're gonna show you something that's actually relatively new. I like to say we have a plan for it, and Albert gets upset every time. It is a concept car. <laughs> um, but it is brand new, and we're definitely excited about it as a new creative way that we can actually think about this. Because we think about the new flexibility 
as providing employees with different types of space within your real estate ecosystem than you might have offered them before. And so this idea of being able to have certain pockets of your campuses or certain pockets of your buildings that you're devoting to creating a different level of experience for them is something that we're really intrigued by and something that we're starting to talk to a lot of our clients about as well. So this is a little bit of the story about how this came to be as well as a sneak peek. Cool. So how do we get there? Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Dean Rakonovic, he was, um, he was visiting from Australia and uh, he was visiting our LA office. And so we took a stroll down to the Venice boardwalk. Um, and as Jason mentioned, all of a sudden we hit the Venice skateboard or skate park. And we sat there and just observed. And what we realized was that it was probably one of the di most diverse crowds that we had seen. How Young. many have been? Okay, this is great. So almost half the room right. knows what we're talking about here. So you see every demographic is represented when you go and sit there and observe. Young, old, um, multi-ethnicity, gender fluidity. I mean, you just see a, a very diverse um, demographic there. So Dean and I started to talk to each other and said, well, why do we think this is so? What is bringing this kind of diversity into the skate park? And what we kind of came up with is it's probably two things. They're coming there to learn, and they're coming there, probably more importantly, they're coming there to play. So if we were to think about this from a workplace perspective, right, is and if we start to think about how people learn and play, we came up with four, and there's some literature and some research around this, but we came, came up with four themes or four ways that people play and people learn. It's through kinesthetic, touching stuff, playing with stuff. It's through getting into a flow state. And if any of you, who's, who's read the book, uh, The Quiet Revolution by Susan Cain, right? Yeah. How important it is to get into that flow state. And that could be a version of playing and or learning. Also, some of us learn by visuals, you know, think about going to a movie. Others perhaps learn by, uh, more by acoustic or auditory means. So when we think about that, we're thinking about how can we bridge the, sort of the, the intersection between play and learning and so that the, when we bring those, that Venn diagram together, what we're really talking about is making a more diverse, a more inclusive, and a more, equi and a more equitable workplace. So uh, you might be asking yourself, fine, well, are you actually suggesting that we put a skate park in our um, office spaces? No, but what we are suggesting is that there are typologies that can affect or, and or can promote uh, kinesthetic um, experiences, visual experiences, auditory experiences, and areas to get into that flow. In fact, um, I think it was, it was Sarah uh, who said something earlier on the panel today, is that we still need spaces to do focus. I would take that one step further and say we need spaces to do single tasking. Uh, because again, I've said this to a few of you already, is that some of the research is indicating that yeah, you can knock out a spreadsheet at home. You can maybe do a few emails at home. But how often have any of us really gotten into two or three hours of being able to single task without answering the door for the Amazon guy or making lunch or feeding the dogs? So we still think that there is an area that, that, act, that still sort of accommodates our playground model but is in that that supports the activity of flow and kind of introspection. Love it. Okay, so here's um, uh, what we call the fun map. This is how it kind of gets laid out. And you'll see that there are uh, numbers for each one of the things that we were talking about. The, the, the entry experience, uh, number three, um, is encouraging curiosity through imaging. Uh, no, uh, area number two, this is kind of what we call the maker space. Uh, that would be the kinesthetic part of it, kind of that maker space. Um, peaking interest with sound over here at four. Over here at six is immersion through the visual. And finally, seven is for that raw, medi what we're calling that raw meditative state. Do you guys want to know what this, what this kind of looks like? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so here is your blank canvas. So the idea is that this actually gives you a way to map into your spaces, whether it is a specific hub within a particular environment, whether it's a floor of a multi-floor environment, 
but a way, to, a way to create something brand new that actually is that sort of blank canvas for your culture and for your brand. And, you're, and I think you're right, Emily. I, this is supposed to be a little bit provocative, a little bit polemical, and it's trying to take a point of view. We're not saying that this is exactly what we would, we would suggest for all of our clients. What this is meant to be is an idea starter of, white, what, of what could be possible. Um, so as you look at the entry experience, what would happen here is we'd walk through, and of course, it would welcome you in some sort of a digital experience. You know, hello, Emily Watkins, how are you today? Your seat is over in neighborhood four, not neighborhood four, but over in uh, immersion <laughs> spot four. You would take your, uh, maybe you have some, uh, you, you wanna grab one of your Oculus glasses, but then as you come over here, what you're gonna see is that kinesthetic area. And what I mean by that is this is really your place to play with stuff. You know, we got 3D printers, we've got robotics. If you're a hardware engineer, you can play with your prototypes. If you're a software engineer, you can play around with code, you can have visual displays up here. This can be a mix between visual, digital, and, um, and analog where you put up, this could be a great scrum space. But the idea is here, it's not necessarily a neighborhood. What this is, is it's space to do that kind of aesthetic playing, to go in there for that maker space. Um, and as we exit the maker space, uh, here's sort of our acoustic lounge. I won't go in there, but what I want to show you is how there's plenty of space here to move around and to make it ad adaptable. We, per, uh, we intentionally made the space very open. You'll see there's some robotics and there's some whiteboards kind of attached to the wall. You know, obviously we can make those move around. There's stadium seating here. But what we're looking to do is create movement through the space, have people run into each other, but also do it in the spirit of playing and learning. And as, and as I said, uh, as some people learn by being visual, maybe here's our, uh, uh, our visual immersion tank. Um, you could do conference calls. You could do really cool presentations from here. You could do learning uh, sessions. You could do all hands. In other words, I don't necessarily think this is exactly the right space solution. What I'm saying is that this could be a concept to think about as you think about a pre, uh, post pandemic um, We work also talked a lot about onboarding of new teams and to be able to have the space where you can send them to do something like this, where they can actually have an experience that is not just read the handbook, right, or watch the presentation. So the idea that you actually have a dedicated area where you can do that. Yeah, and finally we get to this, you know, the raw study space because, because again, another theme is we're trying to say, well, how else do people learn and play? And again, you know, especially for those who, who, who think more creatively while they're introspective, we think that these sorts of environments are also necessary in a post-pandemic work environment. So here you see plenty of light, you know, uh, the biophilia, but just areas you can get away. Maybe it's a library, no matter what you call it, but again, it is a space that can help you get into that flow state. If you want to get out of the immersion tank and you're over, you know, you, you, you've been overloaded, come back into the meditative room and be able to kind of catch your breath a little bit and do some of that uh, flow work or introspective work. Um, the other thing about, about this concept is it's, it's moving away from your traditional neighborhood concept. What we're trying to do here is this could be, for example, Maybe the marketing team and any one of your organizations comes in here for a week. Uh, maybe it's at the bottom of a residential hall or hotel or whatnot, and they stay there for the week. Uh, then when they leave, they don't maybe come back for another two or three months. So this space can be used more as a, I, I, I don't want to call it a conference space, but a teaming area where people can come in that isn't necessary or that can be used as what we call sort of that hub. If people come in, if uh, people are gonna uh, come in maybe once every month, these are one of these spaces that could be available to them. Perfect, yes, exactly. And so maybe the last thing we're gonna end with here is, we're not, again, we're not suggesting that this is the right answer. We just wanna provoke a little bit. We wanna uh, put some new ideas out there. But one thing I think Emily and I, and I think most people in this room would agree with is that I don't care if it's I don't care if it's uh, if, if it's playground. I'm happy to talk to you about it and how we're moving it forward in a more uh, in, uh, uh, executable kind of way. But I think the real danger now, and I'm taking this from our uh, our speaker last night, is you know the risk of doing nothing. Um, now I think is the time, Emily. Both and I think now is the time to really think about what you know what are some bold ideas. What can we pilot? 
Because if you remember, just like Blockbuster, you know, I don't know, when was the last time any of you developed a roll of film? So don't let this be your Kodak moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think, was there a question? Oh, OK, I saw a hand go up. Any questions, comments? Yeah. we would want to execute. And while those concepts for me were a little bit far out there, maybe the robot room and things like that, they were able to take those concepts and translate them into a really relatable format. So what they did was they turned our floor, instead of into a real playground, which that concept piece really feels like, something that you walk into that's a real community space with the barista bar and music, and that's where you're really vibing with people and having a good time, but still getting work done. Maybe you're bringing clients. And then the other half of the floor is a quiet zone, completely heads down work, you know, no music, nothing. And then the other part of the floor is in a combination of both. So a space where you can really move furniture around, make war rooms, do things like this. So we have it on our budget, hopefully, to be able to do it next year. Um, but it really is, I think, a really great solution of how to get people away from their home office. You know, I think people aren't coming anymore for to sit at my desk, you know, and be on a meeting the whole day, because you could just do that at home. So what are you coming in for? And I think it's these kind of experiences that really will be like the driving force. Lorian, drinks are on us all night. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the <laughs> Thank you for the PSA. I think also just getting out there gives you these opportunities to iterate, right? You almost, when you want to think innovatively, you almost want to stretch yourselves to go to the edges in order to come back with something that you can really work through that resonates well within your own organization and your own culture. So love to hear your feedback on that. Thank you, Lorian. I have just time just for one quick thing, if that's OK. All right. It'd be really hard on you, Albert. Good. I would, I would <laughs> uh, expect nothing less, Reagan. Yeah, so I love the idea of the flow. Can you talk a little bit more about that with regards to like teams that, you know, they're returning for the first time? How do you sort of like break through that maybe uncomfortable psychological safety that, you know, as you're returning and the, you know, people trying to come together and like create that flow? Like, how do you get them back into that as they've come back and it's a little bit rigid? So we're, I mean, it's, that's exactly the, the, the challenge that we were trying to address through this concept. In other words, could we get people come back to play? And if they were informal about how they play, would that start to engender trust that they probably hadn't had in Zoom calls? So in, in other words, that this whole sort of concept is trying to get people to come in in a very level playing ground and doing it through the art of play. And the art of play is nothing new. I mean, it's been around for a while, although when the Great uh, Recession hit, Nobody, no organization wanted to pay their employees to play. But I think what we're saying is, is if we can get that kind of sensibility back, you're no longer talking about, you know, somebody has a private office and a workstation and a team room and this. What you're doing is leveling the playing field so that everybody feels invited to come and learn and play. The flow piece is, is, is a little bit different in that we want to create spaces in which people can get into that flow state. So if they do get sort of overwhelmed by how much activity is going out there, there is a spot they can go, they can breathe, and actually, and again, those of you who have not seen the Susan Cain um, TED Talk and or read their book, read her book, basically she says this, is that introverts get screwed in the open environment, right? Because they are often the most creative, uh, but do not have the right venue in which to articulate their creativity, because typically in open offices, extroverts have sort of the forum. Right? So what she was campaigning for is making sure that we do have these spaces in which introverts can go to and actually um, facilitate that creativity th that they typically can't do in an open office. I, I hate to do this, but the discussion is so great. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Cool. And thank you guys for being active participants in this. And like you mentioned, Emily, Nothing like having a conversation about data and utilization than over a drink. So <laughs> we're actually about, about to bust open the doors now and bring those uh, drinks in. But before we do, big round of applause for Unispace. <laughs>